was uh, very honored to have uh, Francois and Lydia Detroit from South Africa in my home. They were just finishing a uh, series of meetings here in Houston. And uh, uh, really, uh, as a result, Barris, of something you did, this meeting came to be. Uh, and that was you posted uh, on one of our uh, PowerCast uh, three or four verses from Mirror Bible. Now, Jeff had bought this Bible for me about a year ago or so. And the way I am with books, I'm just really terrible. Uh, it got set aside and I looked at it and it's like, yeah, but you know, something else somebody wants me to read. And, uh, but when you posted those verses, I was just so blown away. I don't even remember what they were now, but they really just captured me completely because what I teach in context, this gentleman had translated verse by verse from the Greek paraphrased. It so um, inspired me uh, because of the gospel that was in this paraphrased translation from the Greek, which is what Francois does. Does he listen to this show? I don't think he has listened to this show uh, to this point. He's a very busy fellow. He has read one, the gospel according to Mike. What do you think about that? Well, he was just uh, complimentary in every way. I picked them up. It's uh, just a little over 15-minute drive for me. They were already downstairs at the lobby, and I went in to, um, to get them, and we started a conversation there at the front desk that didn't end for another six hours. And then we drove up to my home, and I quite honestly, I feel – a bit of a melancholy feeling today. I've tried to figure out why after having such a great evening. I, so inspirational. I, I don't, goodness, I cried at least three times. They cried at least four times. And after having such a great evening, why I would have this melancholy that is uh, seems to be here. But I, 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 I miss them. It uh, really was an amazing uh, time that we had together and the comparing of war stories. I think if, if there was a way to try to compare, um, it would be, uh, on one level, at least it would be like, uh, a man who had fought in world war one met a man who fought in world war two and were exchanging their battle stories. And uh, it really was amazing. They were very grateful for the efforts of um, the gospel revolution uh, over uh, this past over 30 years. And um, they were amazed at the conclusions that we have come to in the gospel revolution without the um, specific aid of uh, having this beautiful translation of the Bible done. Uh, this this Bible is, and we, we're going to hawk this as much as we possibly can. Goodness, I want everyone to be in possession of this translation. There are more books. He's adding more. I just got a signed copy of one that now has uh, more in it than the red uh, copy that I had. This one is a bit bigger, and it's a blue cover. Uh, he has published also uh, three other books, which I want to tell everybody about also, uh, all of these. Uh, but the explosion and hearing what they are going through, uh, this Bible translation seems to be bringing uh, giants to their knees and uh, giants in the Christian community. They seem to have found a niche and a way of through this uh, paraphrase, paraphrase translation for people to be able to read this and it find that, as we discussed, that is already in them. Now, firstly, uh, it's paraphrased, you say, and it is paraphrased. 
but it's paraphrased with everything that has to do with the Greek grammar is reflected in his notes uh, as to why he's translated a verse a certain way. So it may be a paraphrase, but as near as I can tell, it's a paraphrase that... Um, that that tells you why it's paraphrased that way. Now, if you take something like the old original Living Bible or the Message, they don't do that. They just simply give you the paraphrase. What Francois seems to do is he wants you to understand why he's paraphrased it the way he has, and that makes a lot more sense. It makes a lot more sense to me doing it that way. So while it's a paraphrase, it's actually a better translation than some translations are. And I'd, I'd say that it's uh, something of a hybrid between a paraphrase and a translation. I've never really seen anything quite like this before. Well, it has, uh, it's just divine in, uh, in the way that it comes across uh, verse by verse. Uh, what we have had to dig in for three or four chapters, he can zero in on just a couple of verses and it says the same thing wonderful now you mentioned him uh, this uh, bringing giants to their knees any examples uh yes i not names that i can uh, speak of right now as we know in this gospel revolution that there are uh, people i i i i tell you the story of um, nicodemus comes to mind so many times in these situations where that uh, and, and even Paul, uh, speaking of those people who were of some notoriety, um, that he had to speak with them uh, in private and because of the uh, dangers that lurked about uh, and the losses that could be gained or the losses that could be had because of embracing the gospel, which uh, was happening during Paul's time. It's happening now. Well, you last week we did a show called The Offense of the Cross where we addressed um, a letter that we received from Chris Harrison. And, uh, man, I've, I've been following his uh, Facebook page just last week. Talk about a storm, and there's no teacup about it. Talk about a storm. This guy has stirred up some real activity. And all he and and he he hasn't done nearly as much as say what Joseph Prince did when he was calling you, or what other people have done with France, Francois de Toit. Uh, and and we can't really name them because it's it's their prerogative to uh, to name themselves yes. should they want to. Yeah, and that that is my position on and, that. And when you do, you, like you said, you've got to be so careful because you have a position. You don't want to trade out that position for something which is not real, and you want to find out if this thing is real before you do that, I, I, I suppose. Well, it is. A, everybody has their own process, whether it's a housewife or a husband or a teenager. Uh, this introduction into the reality of this amazing gospel, uh, it is a process, and there are pastors. Now, uh, the thing that is happening with the Mirror Bible is the exact same thing that has happened through the Gospel Revolution, and that is the people that are impacted and affected the most uh, when you break down everyone into different categories and groups are people in the ministry and especially pastors. And that's what Francois is experiencing now is these contacts from uh, from around the world uh, about this. Um, uh, he spoke here in Houston. Uh, I was just blown away at the people that uh, attended. One of the most beautiful things about it is is that Lydia is 100% uh, in, involved. Uh, she is not a detached bystander watching this happen. She's very much this, uh, the, the revelation and understanding of the gospel is very much hers. I played uh, some of Kate Benham for them. Uh, they were in tears. They, uh, they loved every bit of her work. Uh, they said that they had heard of her and uh, that someone had shared with them in South Africa the the uh, songs, a couple of the songs from Kate Benham, which I just made me feel like proud papa, of course. Wow, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of her songs on her new uh, CD that were written here uh, in my home. So here we have this incredible thing that's happening folks and I 
Uh, I want to share this with uh, everyone because uh, things are happening and spinning so far out of anyone's control that we all just sit back and are amazed. Um, uh, uh, One of the funny things about uh, meeting Francois is I, I found out he also does not like to read, and the fact that he read one the book according to Mike is as uh, unlikely as I read uh, Mirror Bible. So we have two minor miracles that took place there. <laughs> and the other thing that we, uh, Francois and I, found that we were very much alike in, which just blew me away is he absolutely is in the same position I am about public speaking. <laughs> now, now, just for our listeners' benefit, where is that? Well, I have a uh, panic disorder to where that getting up in front of people is a very difficult thing for me. And uh, we both got such a great chuckle. His wife looked up and was just, I was just telling them kind of where I was. And um, uh, and uh, Lydia uh, spoke up and said, same as Francois. Uh, we got together, and I think the first thing that we did was something that only a revelation of grace would prompt. We rejoiced in our weaknesses. <laughs> it was really quite unique. Uh, you know, I – they – they did not come here trying to uh, impress me. Uh, I was not trying to impress them. And it really was strange how that the conversation all kind of was spurred on by the fact that we were uh, acknowledging our weaknesses and, and laughing about our weaknesses. It really was quite amazing. This is the um, – I'll show you, uh, Barris. The folks can't see it, but – this is the new mirror Bible. As you can see, it is yeah. bigger. Yep. And um, that's almost an eight by eleven, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it is uh, it is uh, really beautiful. It's very simple. And um, uh, I just have to share this uh, with you guys. I did have uh, him to uh, sign my new mirror Bible uh, before they left. We were just, it was just really, it was difficult for uh, both of us. We were both in tears at the hotel, uh, having to move on. And uh, uh, precious Lydia, oh my gosh, uh, she refused to walk into the hotel and stood waving uh, at my car as I pulled out and around the corner to leave the hotel. They didn't just get out. I got out, and, of course, you know, we said our goodbyes, but she refused to leave until my car was out of, out of sight. Well, that's, so, that's that's more than you did for me, mate. You just booted me, <laughs> booted me out and said, yeah, rack off, hairy legs. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the mechanics now or something silly. Uh, I actually thought about that. Uh, I thought about my trip taking you to the airport and i was thinking oh at least i don't have to think that i may break down uh i know a breakdown is still as as possible but at least i'm not in that vehicle anyway (laughs) so um so what all did you discuss mate six hours is a long time i i wish i could tell you barris i honestly don't know um we we talked about the um place that the gospel now holds uh, and its position uh, on the planet. And uh, my goodness, uh, with the work of uh, many other people now, a a lot of it uh, uh, evolving out of the gospel revolution, um, and with uh, Francois's work and this new translation, uh, that affirms the gospel. I, you know, you don't you don't know by reading this whether or not someone uh, teaches or believes that the world was redeemed at the cross. But we, that that is in fact the position that uh, the Dutois uh, take. And uh, it was just so it was just so fun having never met and 
I, I mean, both of us were coming out of our seats because no matter what he said, I was absolutely coming out of my seat. No matter what I said, they were coming out of their seats. And um, so uh, sharing things back and forth and uh, how all of this took place in each of our lives uh, really was it really was good. There was six and a half hours. A, a, a lot of it was. Uh, sharing the uh, the verses and the uh, gospel itself that he and I both are teaching, um, and the uh, you know uh, the reality of the redemption of the world and the fact that you know there's there's going to be a lot of people who read the mirror Bible that do not come to that conclusion. But uh, Francois says, well, he said, you, you can't hold off the truth very long. So, <laughs> so uh, we both uh, have the – they have the persuasion that we in the gospel revolution have, and that is just this uh, relentless, pervasive, uh, exciting view of the future. Uh, I told him about the song Amazing Grace, which everybody loves Amazing Grace, you know, whether you're a legalist or not. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing that, uh, really got me, I just here just a couple of weeks ago, I was watching and I, this girl was singing, I think uh, for a sports event or something. And, and, uh, she actually was singing Amazing Grace. And she changed one word in it that absolutely brought me to my knees. And she was, you know, the, the line in it that we all are very familiar with. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shiny, bright shining as the sun. And she uh, changed that. And she sang, when we've been here 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. Mm. And... Um, uh, we talked a lot about the terminal mentality of Christianity and uh, the the abuse. They agreed that the abuse uh, that children go through by being taught a terminal in time doctrine, and um, the uh, and I, when I shared that with them, they were very much uh, moved by the change of the word. You know that we can actually have this reality. That, you know, when we die, this is going to go on. I, it, I spent so many years thinking that uh, I was not going to die. The only time I was going to be leaving this planet is when we all left. Uh, there seems to be something very. I used, to have a, I used to have a sticker on the back of my car years ago. Rapture, the only way to fly. <laughs> 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 but have you noticed that the end times uh, doctrine um, slash uh, dogma slash teaching slash mentality it relies for its power on the fact that it's never happened yes see if it hasn't happened could be tomorrow could be tomorrow yeah. you don't want to don't look don't give over your faith tonight because it, it could be tomorrow jesus will come mm -hmm. and um and i never ever heard anyone uh explain the thessalonian verse but it ain't going to happen until that man of sin is revealed. Now, you and I know who that man of sin actually really is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we In Christianity, we called him a man of sorrows. What a name. We should have said, what man of sin, what a name for the Son of God who came. But for its power, for its fear factor, for its um, manipulative, uh, coercive power, the end times doctrine has to rely on the fact that it not only well it doesn't re rely openly on the fact that it ain't never going to happen but it does really it intrinsically depends on the fact oh. that it's never going to happen because it's never going to run out of manipulative power yes and the uh the 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 tremendous need that we have on this planet for that to be challenged in a logical way where that the abuse of that terminal mentality can be taken away um, goodness, I was I, well. To, well, know, to believe I, to believe the sky's the limit, which is what we want our kids to believe. Listen, the sky's exactly. the limit. Exactly, America. Anyone can become president. I mean, this whole sky's. A, you can't. The sky's the limit. Someone, if God might come back tomorrow, and you're going to mm -hmm. be on judgment row. Yes, there is no. There, it is so such conflict. It yeah. is just creates such conflict with just everyday life, and especially for children, and. Um, Oh, and I have to tell you, I've been invited to South Africa. 
so I'm I'm looking forward to that. I was also invited to a Grace Cruise. A Grace uh, Cruise. A Grace Cruise. They're sending me all of the information. I'll be uh, participating in this. And uh, I told them we'll probably have a bunch of gospel revolutionaries that would like to jump on this boat and go with us. You bet. So <laughs> because there's been several over several years, people have uh, discussed, you know, wanting us to make plans to do something like this. Mm-hmm. And now that uh, uh, Francois and some others have already organized this. Uh, I think, you know, hey, we'll just jump on board. We don't have to do any of the organizing. It's done, and uh, it will be uh, tremendous. So we've got, and goodness, they've uh, they've got um, at least a, 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 I would, a minimum of uh, one to two dozen people that they want to introduce me to that. Uh, and, and it was really amazing because they were, some of the people that they've met, told them you must meet Mike Williams and these people are people that have never met me before so and I say those things to encourage people in the gospel revolution is the words getting out folks and we need uh, we needed to hear that we needed to hear that Mike. We did. yes say it again that they are encountering people who are telling them that they need to meet Mike Williams so um, and, and these are people in ministry, people who are absorbing the material that we have that aren't in contact with us really at all, uh, but that they are uh, – it's impacted their lives, their ministries, and what they say and how they say. So, um, uh, yeah, it was just uh, terribly, terribly encouraging. Um, and uh, this this new Bible, goodness gracious, the uh, inscription that – Francois left, and uh, uh, he wrote up the whole inside oh, of the dang. Look at that. first page, and um, uh, from he and Lydia both, and he put some Bible verses in here, and we've got to look them up and see what they say. I think we should do that here on the show. Let's do it. Hey, that reminds me of a story. Someone was telling me, I can't remember who it was, uh, they went to a book signing, and uh, they were expected to to you know put something christian in there so he just made this verse up oh psalm you know 53 4 <laughs> and and it stuck in his brain whatever the verse was it stuck in his brain and um and because uh, you know you can't go wrong with the psalms right everything's going to mm-hmm. be good in the psalms and he gets home and he looks up what this verse was that he just wrote down to impress these people with and it was i forget what it was it was something that was he, he just wanted to go take that book back and give him another one <laughs> <laughs> We are Gospel Revolution. So what are these verses, mate? Well, there is one here, Second Timothy one nine. What uh, pull that up for us and read it. I, I'm wanting to share this experience with everybody. I, I haven't looked these up yet. Uh, there, there's a couple of them I think I know what they are, but I've not gone directly to them. But I want to share this with uh, the rest of our family of these wonderful uh, comments. And um, uh, I showed Barris the, f- uh, the first page of this is written from top to bottom with his wonderful greeting um, from uh, Francois and Lydia. And with these Bible verses is that, added. Is that 2 uh, Timothy, Timothy or 1 Timothy? 2 Timothy one nine. Okay. Well, I'm going to read it to you first out of the King Jimmy. And then I'll read it to you out of Francois's uh, new uh, Bible, the Mirror Bible. Oh, this will be wonderful. Thank you. So here we go. One nine in the King Jimmy says, Who has, talking about uh, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I've, I have read so much King James in my life that I've got to, I've got to rethink everything sometimes. Here it is in uh, Francois' wonderful translation, the Mirror Bible, two Timothy one nine. He rescued the integrity of our original identity and revealed that we have always been His own from the beginning, even before time was. This has nothing to do with anything we did to qualify or disqualify ourselves. 
We are not talking of religious good works or karma here. Jesus unveils grace to be the eternal intent of God. Grace celebrates our pre-creation innocence and now declares our redeemed union with God in Christ Jesus. Wow. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's wonderful. Now, uh, now, that's the Mirror Bible. That's the Mirror Bible, and that's about uh, eight or nine lines long. And after that is maybe 30 or 40 lines explaining why he translated it that way. That's the Mirror Bible. Oh, it's so wonderful. I'm just going to say, I was, I'm, I, 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 this brought me to tears, and uh, this, this Bible did, this translation uh, uh, did bring me to tears, the it, impact that it had. One of the things that, uh, we'll go to these other verses in just a moment, uh, one of the things that Francois, he considered himself having stepped uh, out into the um, Christian mindset while he was here teaching, one of the things that he told me he taught was was this, because uh, uh, I had shared with them about the teachings that I do about being born again and that all took place at the cross. And uh, uh, a lot of these things, he just, there's so many people that they would never agree with so many of the doctrines, but they are so reeled in by this translation, which its conclusion is all of these things. And he told me that he taught on the, the three births that all humanity has gone through. Uh, and, and in his teaching, he said that we were first we were first birthed in the mind of God, that our first creation, our first existence was in the mind of God before time, even as he translated there in mm. that verse. He said our second birth was when we came into this planet, into this realm, that we came out of the mind of God into this realm, and we went through another birth. And he said the other one that all humanity went through was when Christ was raised from the dead. And uh, so <laughs> He taught these folks wow. that everyone was born again when Christ was raised from the dead. And I, he wasn't real sure they got it, but he, he was sure that he said it. And wow. uh, I, um, um, there is, there's no way that I can communicate to you guys um, the joy of this encounter Actually, it turned out to be a great joy for both of us. I, I'm just, I was just uh, uh, almost overwhelmed at the uh, clarity that uh, Francois and Lydia had, and their affirmation of me. Goodness gracious! If if you guys ever wanted to know that somebody treated me uh, uh, better than well, treated me like royalty, you need to thank Lydia and Francois. Uh, because they did nothing but acknowledge the work of the gospel that I've done. They did nothing but honor that and respect that. Uh, they did nothing but just uh, give heaps of encouragement and love and appreciation. And um, it was it really was amazing. So that's the first verse. That just before we go to the next verse, um do you know what his background is? Now, we know that you you were birthed probably, if you want to say, in fundamental evangelicalism and from there moved to Word of Faith movement, which some people would call the Pentecostal movement, a la the Assemblies of God and so forth. What was his genealogy spiritually? Well, uh, what he was born in, first born into, I'm not real sure. I know that he taught, uh, he was in ministry for 14 years and was with Dutch Reform. And oh, wow. they they kicked him out. Uh, they asked him to come, and they asked him to leave. <laughs> have you ever have you ever known Dutch? Re uh, oh, I've been not saying. I my my daughters went to a Dutch reform school for a while, and I I ended up calling them a bunch of neo Nazis. <laughs> I, I don't think it endeared me to anyone. No, I probably didn't. Uh, now the interesting thing is that now that he's published this Bible. The um, Reformed Church is now inviting him back. Oh, really? Oh, really? Now we've got <laughs> our errant son has become famous. Let's let's own him. 
you know, there, so, there is this amazing thing that out of some of the I used to I used to uh, have a have a message I called uh, rosebud on the rubbish tip. Uh, when you see a rosebud that grows out of a rubbish tip, Granny Smith apples is a great example. Granny Smith apple was a lady out in Parramatta in Western Sydney. She um, yeah, a couple of hundred years ago, she uh, threw a bunch of apples out there. This apple tree grew out of it, and that's the source of Granny Smith apples that we have here in America. Hmm. You don't know where uh, where light's going to shine. You've got um, you've got uh, Rick, uh, Rob uh, Schuller. What was Schuller's first name? Was it Robert Schuller? Robert Schuller. Robert yes. Schuller. He came out of the Dutch Reformed Church, and he was a Dutch Reformed Church. And it's just amazing how much freedom you can find in some of these places. So Francois was associated there, right? Eh? Yes, uh, he was, and uh, then went out of ministry for 14 years and decided that uh, since he didn't like uh, being on stage, uh, much like myself, that he was going to write. And then he started putting these things down. And uh, when people began to embrace them, he thought, oh, wow, this is wonderful. I get to just write and stay home and I don't have to get on the stage again. But what it's done, of course, is open the stage for him again. Wow. And um, so he has to deal with the same thing uh, over again. What's the next verse? Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, in the King Jimmy, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3 reads, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. <sighs> I mean, you've got to take that apart phrase by phrase just to even understand what it's saying. Okay, let's see what Francois de Toit's Mirror Bible says. The fact that you are a Christ epistle shines as bright as day. This is what our ministry is all about. The Spirit of God is a living ink. Wow. Every trace of the Spirit's influence on the heart is what gives permanence to this conversation. We are not talking law language here. This is more dynamic and permanent than letters chiseled in stone. This conversation is embroidered in your inner consciousness. This man's a bloody poet, mate. Oh, I know. <laughs> Yes, uh, and to add that into uh, that wonderful ability into this translation, I think it's fantastic. Mm. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse eight. By the way, this is really delightful for me because I'm I'm getting to see what the personal note was in the fact that he left these verses in my signed copy, and. Um, uh, I get to hear it from the King James and from the Mirror Bible. This is my first time. Thank you, Paris. Well, I was I was brought up a King James only, mate. So you know, I can't I can't really forsake my upbringing here. <laughs> so we have Paul saying, and he's describing himself here in two Corinthians four verse eight. He says, "We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Uh, persecuted, but not forsaken, and so forth." And Francois de Toit in the Mirror Bible translates it, We often feel completely hemmed in on every side, but our inner space remains unrestricted. When there seems to be no way out, we escape within. <laughs> Is that not cute? <laughs> and oh, it's, my goodness. It's true. It is true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> wow. uh, the next one is Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Verse 18 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians in King Jimmy reads, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Mm. And here is how Francois de Tort in the Mirror Bible translates that. We are not keeping any score of what seems so obvious to the senses in the natural realm. It is fleeting and irrelevant. It is the unseen eternal realm within us that has our full attention and captivates our gaze. Mm. <laughs> you know yeah. what, mate? You know in Psalms how every every time, every now and again the psalmist says "Selah," which uh, which we were always told meant "think on this, just pause and consider this." Mm -hmm. Well, after every verse I read in in this mirror Bible, I want to I want to say a "Selah" too, but it, it's it's pronounced "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> Sila, wow. 
Oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is all about what's inside us. This is all yeah. about the unseen the in- eternal realm. Yes, the uh, everything that uh, that these folks teach and try to communicate is that all that is is within. And uh, we had uh, uh, at one point Lydia threw her hands straight up in the air when I was uh, and and Francois also when I was telling them that I've for the last three years I was doing everything I could do to destroy this concept of a God out there. And uh, they were just, of course, these, you know, when these things become a part of you, to hear that somebody else is doing it yes. and saying it, I, I know that feeling because, like I say, I, you know, this was uh, such an amazing thing last well, night. Well, every gospel revolutionary has had that feeling. The first time every- they heard someone say what agreed with the truth that was internalized in them, and they couldn't figure they they knew there was a truth there. They knew there was a reality there. They knew there was something there, but they couldn't vo- vocalize it. They couldn't put it into words. And then yes. someone comes along. Now, this was what you were like for me, you rascal. You put words to the song that was in my heart. Yes. And suddenly I could say, oh, wow, I wanted to throw my arms up too, mate. Yeah. Yeah, it is uh, one of the most powerful experiences I think we can have as human beings is to identify that which has always been in us and uh, finding that reality and that it's not out there somewhere. It's not something to be strived for through the flesh, uh, speaking of law, that it is simply – uh, and we both spoke of how wonderful it is to tell people things that we know they already know. Mm. And uh, it, it makes this so easy. You know, it's like uh, you can get past the bluster. Uh, and in some of our war stories that we told, uh, and as I have said, the vast majority of people who are listening to us right now. Uh, really despised me long before they ever loved me. (laughs) And uh, because of the uh, contradictions, many of them first met the contradiction of uh, what was uh, not serving the self-righteous pursuit they were on. So, yeah, this the entire emphasis of uh, uh, Francois and Lydia is to acknowledge that which is within, nothing more and nothing less, and that all of that was uh, culminated at the cross, at the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So we have one, uh, let's see, did we do verse 18, 2 Corinthians four eighteen? Yes, we did that one. All right. And now we have one more, 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. One thing, it's also... Uh, Francois's uh, strong uh, persuasion and uh, the thing that he declares before everyone is the issue of faith, that faith is a God thing, not a man thing, and that this was God's faith, not man's faith, that brought all of this about, that man's faith had nothing to do with it at all. (laughs) It's like, I can't believe I'm sitting on my sofa talking to... Uh, a, a person who has written a translation of the Bible who's saying these things. So uh, uh, needless to say, we were both excited. Oh, that's What's wonderful. this verse say? Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, isn't it? Yes. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Mm-hmm. And here is how Francois de Toit puts it in the Mirror Bible. There was a time of suspense when everything we saw was merely mirrored in the prophetic word, like like in an enigma. But then, brackets, when I became a man in the revelation of Christ, brackets, I gazed face to face. Behold, I am in him. Now I may know, even as I have always been known. Hmm. Very good. <laughs> So the, those verses were in hang, hang my, on, hang on. Go ahead. Wow. Wow. Okay. Say that. <laughs> Let me also introduce to everyone that uh, Francois does have three other books now that is uh, in uh, publication. He has several major publishers now who want to publish Mirror Bible. 
but they are waiting until he finishes all of it because they want to be the publishers of this entire thing. So this is this is really such good news. It's just uh, it really is fantastic. Wow. Uh, one of the books that he has here, uh, Barris, as you can see, God uh, believes in you. Sly. God believes in you. Available on Amazon for fifteen dollars in a paperback, and you can have it within two days if you're a Prime member. Yes, God believes in you. Hey, and hang on. God believes in you. Well, he just he just swiped your title there, didn't he? <laughs> Wait. That's the thing about this gospel is that. Uh, the, the, all of these titles are coming out of people's hearts. It really is just so very powerful. And uh, I, to, I will never forget the first time I heard you say that. It was very early in the piece. It might have been your second or third tape that I ever ever listened to, and uh, you asked the simple question, well, what do you think is more important, what you believe in God or what God believes in you? And that just never left me. Mm, and it's just so amazing. Well, and it is true, Barris. The uh, the power of the gospel is not in what we find out about God. I I you know, I finally relinquished completely any thought that I might understand God at all. I uh, I do think that whatever I know about Him, compared to who and what He is, that my understanding is extremely limited and most likely incorrect. But that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel isn't about my accurate interpretation of who and what God is and does. The gospel is the accurate understanding of what God himself believes about me. Uh, and that accurate interpretation of what he knows is true about me. And uh, that is the gospel. Uh, we're not trying to teach people uh, what God is like and what he does and doesn't do. We can tell you what he did, but that's going to be totally focused around the cross. And this is for a uh, completely for a restored identity. Um, we have another book, this one. Logic of His Love, available for five thirty nine in paperback off Prime for two days uh, delivery for those of you who are Prime members on Amazon. Yes, and this is um, uh, this is uh, just a thirty two page book. You'll I'm sure you will enjoy it. I haven't had time to uh, look at it yet myself. And here is. Um, uh, another one, uh, we discussed uh, fractals and uh, Lydia and Francois just was over the moon when I pulled them up. I said, do you want to see a picture of the gospel? <laughs> wow. uh, it was it was I so baited them. It was just not fair. <laughs> and uh, that I was actually going to show them pictures of the gospel and they, they were just captivated. So um, I pulled up the, my got out my computer and and put in fractals and pulled up a whole page. And of course, then this issue of fractals and that the, the smallest is an expression of the largest part. And the largest part is an expression of the smallest part. And uh, of course, when you understand the gospel, you know that that is the truth. So uh, this was uh, a really, really sweet thing. And actually here in this uh, picture on the front of this book is a fractal in and of itself uh, in this uh, yeah. flower that's on here. Yep. And uh, the title of it is Divine Embrace. Well, now, uh, and that's available also on Amazon. Uh, you don't have to be a Prime member to get it, but a Prime member will get it within two days, free delivery. Uh, Francois Dutoit has written a very short but excellent treatise on the gospel, says one reviewer here. And, and you're not going to believe the name of this reviewer, buddy. It's Victor C. Van der Broek Dobrenen. Oh, really? <laughs> and some of the reviews are titled The Heart of the Matter. I see truth much clearer now. Christ is all in all and his faith and spirit in us renew our minds to our true, true identity. Rooted and grounded, awakening experience. What a powerful truth, stunning, the best news explained with clarity. Um, these one, okay, the logic of his love. God Believes in You, Divine Embrace, you just mentioned, are all five stars. Do you know how few products on Amazon get five stars? These are all five stars, mate. And really? You, and you've got like 20-odd like reviews with each one. 
Mirror Bible has uh, 40, 45 reviews, and you can be sure that some people who hate paraphrases had a word in here, and it's still four and a half stars. Mirror Bible Blue Edition, woohoo, 25 bucks, four and a half stars. God Believes in You, five stars. This guy, obviously, now here's an interesting thing. You see his Bibles are only four and a half stars, but every one of his books, every single one of his books are five stars. That means people love what he says. Don't so much love the fact that he wants to retranslate the Bible. <laughs> Francois and Lydia about the, the phase of the ministry where I went through where I was teaching such as the great high priest and people were coming up telling me that they uh, were really appreciative of the ministry but they had decided that the whole world had been redeemed and they were moving on and uh, thank you for bringing us as far as you could but we've moved way beyond you now Mike so. and and and, and the, your income <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, exactly. we we and our tithes are going somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just I'm persuaded that with uh, that without uh, personal agenda, the gospel reveals the redemption of the world. You know, the interesting thing last week when I was looking at the pushback in Chris Harrison's group, in in one of his groups about the redemption of the world concept and some of them had listened and some just some just flatly refused to it's uh, i mean like it doesn't matter where you find the truth uh, blow it out of the water anyway yeah. you know if, if uh, anyway every single person who was against it every last person who was against it was against it on the basis of only one thing and that was we have to believe we have mm -hmm. to do something ourselves. If we don't have a part in our own holiness and righteousness and salvation, well, it ain't real. If, if we can't, we there's got to look. Just tell us we have to eat ice cream, or tell us we've got to sit on a chair, or tell us to believe. We yeah. have to have something to be able to point to ourselves and see, say, see, see, I did it. I did the right thing. See me massaging my self righteousness here, and and yet when you point this out, you said once on one of your tapes. Um, Paul said, "Where the law is, there is wrath." And if you, yes. if, if you ever if you ever want to see uh, real wrath, look at a legalist. And mate, I was astounded. There wasn't two arguments. There wasn't several ways people came at it. There was a one way. If we don't have something to do with it, if we personally, and it doesn't matter how how often you point to people and say yes, and how many people had to do something to be Im imputed with sin under Adam, it doesn't matter that Romans says even so. In the Greek, in exactly the same way, so by one man righteousness came on all. Yeah, uh, and why should that mean anything? It's just in the Bible. You know? <laughs> yeah, true. Well, and and you know, of course, the thing that uh, we were very diligent to do was to explore um, uh, the entire book of John and get the context. Uh, and, and let me say this because this is uh, – people have such a difficulty with this area of the requirement to believe. Now, uh, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of John uh, comes up with the term uh, believe in some form over 90 times. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the term believe shows up in some form 25 times in all three books put together. So we can say that if you're going to learn about the requirement to believe, probably the information in its fullest is going to be in the book of John. So um, here just about three years ago, I did that research and that study, and um, well, maybe it had been more than that. Time's flying as you have fun. So, um, But the... 
uh, reading of John chapter 12. How do you remove that? That the yes, it does say if you don't believe, you got to believe. Uh, if um, whosoever believeth, uh, it says that, and I can tell you, it says it almost ninety times. But you can't leave out the time that it says that nobody could believe in chapter twelve of John. You know, the thing that I realized, mate, was that the one thing that goes along with this self righteousness. There is an interesting thing. I I have not seen it separated uh, in anybody who's ever responded to me. It is it is a, every time it's the same, and that is proof texting. In order to maintain my self righteousness, I have to be able to pull a text out of here and a text out of there and a text somewhere else, and then cobble them all together into a gospel. I said to somebody somebody else, I didn't raise it. Someone else raised on Chris's page this week about believe and be baptized, and you will be saved. And I said, so what do you make of that verse? Do you feel that we should be baptized in order to be saved? And immediately they deflected to another verse and suddenly that verse didn't matter. They could carve that straight out of the Bible. There is something that goes along with insisting that I have a part in my own salvation that also demands that I pull texts out of here, there and everywhere and I can't read anything all the way through in context because it might make a liar out of me. I have to just cobble together proof texting in order to satisfy my doctrine. Uh, and, and these people get awfully angry with you. You try and, mm-hmm. you try and say that uh, maybe that's not right. I'm telling you, you, you are in for a... Um, there's a word for it, but I can't use it here. <laughs> but you're in for a big one. <laughs> Well, uh, Barris, it is um, it is my absolute persuasion that on a minimal basis, that by saying you have something to do with your own redemption, your own salvation, that you were a participant in that, which in, which partially makes you your own savior, makes you your own savior, and thereby reducing the very character and the nature of the one you say was your redeemer. You have reduced him. You must, if you're consistent, then say it was Jesus' death plus my participation Mm -hmm. that resulted in my salvation. You can't say it was just Jesus' death. Yeah, and we're probably going to get some folks mad at us again. But, you know, uh, the fact of it is is that this uh, we view the cross— the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ as being conclusive, inclusive, uh, final, finite, infinite. It is uh, all in all with that which is spiritual. We do not, under any circumstances, define spirituality based on what someone has believed or not believed. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. What you're saying sounds far too uh, slippery and similar to it is finished kind of sounds that way it's like uh francois said last night what part of it is finished do you not get <laughs> i love that <laughs> and uh, well my part don't think much of your part but i think a lot of my part yes uh especially if you if you you're a dutch reform or if you're a baptist or if you're anyone else i disagree with i don't think much of your part but i think a lot of my part mm-hmm. yes and the joy of being a non-participant uh, in your own redemption. And then, of course, all of the uh, fence laws that those who require belief put out because they can't answer the questions, what about children? Uh, what about people who are mentally challenged? What about people who've never heard and never will hear? They cannot answer those questions. And that's where they introduce if and but or maybe. What do you love and most about the gospel, Michael? The one thing I love about the gospel was the realization, not the deliberate intent, but the realization that I had not said if and but or maybe in many years. Uh, the answer is the answer, and it's not the answer if, not the answer but, it's not the answer maybe. And the fact of it is, if you take all the grace that is talked about in the Bible, All the gospel of peace talked about in the Bible, uh, if you take that and you offer it only to the believer, you have, in essence, completely destroyed the gospel itself. 
Behold the yes. Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the grace visited. Uh, yes, goodness gracious. Thank God for uh, even the King James, what he says on that, you know. Uh, but, folks, this is vitally important, and we do appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, have this examined, but we ask you to examine it. Go and look these things up. I know you can stand off at a far and be ticked off and mad and, and all of this stuff, but go read John chapter 12. Don't just pull John 3.16 out. Take John 3.16 and read all the way through to John chapter 12. And the if you're going to believe something about believing, let the writer about believing explain to you what believing was all about. And the fact that two prophets, two prophets spoke of the time of Christ and said no one would be able to believe. And he blinded their eyes and stopped their ears from being able to even understand that they might be able to believe. No accident there. N none whatsoever. So, you know, uh, before you get your drawers in a, in, a, in a knot, you know, why not go read this stuff, folks? You know why and I like the gospel? You know what, the, what I like most about the gospel, Michael? Why? What I like about the gospel is when everyone is redeemed, it is truly good news. It is no good news when 10% of the population of the world is going to heaven. That ain't good news. That is like, no. you, would you get your open heart surgery done by a doctor that only had, uh, I don't know, 10%, 15%, 20% success rate? I don't think so. But you'll, no. you will stake your eternal outcomes on it. Now, the thing I want to do, I would love to do, is go back and ask each of those who so strongly defended Christianity, not the gospel. They defended Christianity and said that you must believe. That is a defense of Christianity. Yep. And uh, I would like to ask them what they did this week. If you believe that, what did you do this week? You can't possibly believe that and have an ounce of compassion in your heart and not have at least a list of people that you persuaded to believe this week. What have you done with your time? What have you done with your time? And again, uh, you know, why stand and pastor and nurture a bunch of people that already got it? Why? How can I? How could I do that? Pastoring over a congregation with a gospel that says, 90% of the people are on their way to hell because they've not heard the gospel, and I spend my Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night encouraging the believer. Go get the people that are going to hell. It's even worse than that, mate. Only one penny, one penny in every $1,000 raised yep. in North American churches make it to yep. any of the 800 ethno-linguistic groups who have never heard the name of Jesus but have heard the name Coca-Cola. That's number one. Number two, over 90% of all the money collected in churches in North America go towards supporting the building, yep. really, and paying the pastor. Yep. And the other 10%, the other like 9.909%, that goes towards evangelizing countries that have already heard the gospel. Did you know... Australia has more American missionaries than anyone else. We've heard the gospel. Why don't you take it to Borneo for crying out loud? Take it to the mountain people of, of northern Thailand. Take it to the Aboriginal groups in Japan. Take it to people who've never heard the name of Jesus. No, that'd be too easy. I'm sorry, mate. I just get I get so well, angry about this. It is. It's infuriating because it's such an insult to the cross. That's the thing. And the yeah. uh, uh, indignation that Paul spoke of is what we are expressing as uh, the, uh, the, the, the need to apply man's performance, uh, whether it's his belief or his obedience, to the work of the cross to make sure that the blood of Christ works. Let's, let's take the drop of a blood of a goat. Uh, and add that to the blood of Christ just to make sure. Uh, and to me, uh, adding belief to the redemption that God has done by himself is as acceptable to me. I can keep my mouth shut about it as much as if someone stood up and said, the blood of Christ is what sets us free, but you need the drop a drop of the blood of a goat to just mix in with that DNA 
to make it effective. Which is exactly the same as saying grace is all you need, uh, but you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. Yeah. It's putrid, folks. Hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up, God said the very best thing you can do is like filthy, filthy rags. It, it means the best thing I can offer God is filthiness, is unacceptableness. And really, you want to say that without your belief, Jesus' whole whole purpose for being meant yeah. nothing. And again, Barris, this I will not I will not allow the the time pass or the water to go under the bridge a moment without holding these people who make this profession uh, to their feet to the fire, because I know they are good people. I know that they are kind and loving people. Their doctrine, though, says 90% of this world is going to hell, and I will guarantee you that the vast majority of them in the last year has not won anybody to the Lord. Let me tell you what I did when I believed. When I believed that you had to believe, I sold all my possessions and goods and parted them to the church. I brought them and laid them down at the apostles' feet of the group that I that was out there uh, preaching every day. I gave up my car. I gave up my clothing. I didn't even have my own clothing. The clothing came from a pile that you had to go in. Everybody's everybody put everything in, and then what you needed, you went and got that day. There were people in charge of getting the clothing and putting it on hangers and and, and this stuff. Eating, I gave up eating good meals. I, in fact, I went hungry for three months in Puerto Rico um, because I believed that you had to believe. And so I gave up my existence on this planet to do nothing. And this, this was my equation. If I would work eight hours a day to feed my face and clothe my body, how much more – if God clothed the lily of the field, does he not know that you need these things? And I, that was part of my uh, uh, defense for doing what I did, that God knows I need clothes. God knows I need food. Those people are going to hell. And that is my job. That is, And so eight hours a day, eight hours a day, seven days a week, I witnessed. I knocked on doors. I walked the beaches. Of uh, of this country and uh, around uh, Puerto Rico, uh, we uh, went to shopping malls. Uh, I, I, people have heard me tell about uh, burning blisters on the bottom of my feet, being down in Florida and winding up having to be on pavement. And I'm standing there witnessing to somebody while the blisters came up on my feet to the point to where that I couldn't put shoes on the next day. Uh, but I could not interrupt this communication with this person because their eternity was at stake Barris blisters on my feet why why would I move and take the blisters make sure oh that Mike Williams didn't have blisters on his feet when they might get hit by a bus on the way walking exactly. away from there exactly yeah hey listen this Francois de Toit visit seems to have woken up a, something <laughs> something here yeah, I am we- rekindled yes I am rekindled and uh, anybody that thinks that the gospel revolution is going to back off of the redemption of the world and the, the complete work of Christ, you just need to rethink it. We don't want you to be mad. We want to have a really sweet time with you. And remember, we opened last week's show with this quotation. We said, when an honest man discovers he is mistaken, he will either cease being mistaken or he will cease being honest. And so it is that we must leave you folks We love you one and all And we especially thank all who with your financial support Keep this message of grace and peace going out every week If you'd like to join them in increasing our coverage of this gospel Call our office at area code 321-220-4373 And speak to Jeffrey If you would like to leave a message for the show Simply telephone us on area code 234-564-0971 Our web address is www.gospelrevolution.com and we are always up for a Facebook chat at Friends of Mike Williams and the Gospel Revolution. Thanks to Marcel Rose who introduced me to the Mirror Bible and after that Barry Landy actually gave me one, bought one and gave it to me. That's a friend for you. 
Thanks to Marcel Ross in the Netherlands, all the gospel all the time is being broadcast 24-7 at myradiostream.com forward slash gospel revolution. And so it is good night from myself, Beres Bartlett. And it's good evening from Mike Williams here. We're delighted. I uh, I admit my melancholy today after my uh, uh, wonderful visit yesterday. Our best in the gospel revolution to uh, Francois and Lydia. We support everything that you do. Uh, we would support the air that you breathe, the preciousness of willingness to share the truth with this world is not to be uh, looked over. And uh, we love you. We thank you. We thank you so much for your efforts. We thank you so much for your dedication and your time and uh, what you're getting. I don't know how you have kept the schedule that they gave you here in America. So hope you get some rest. We love you. And Gospel Revolutionaries, uh, cause this is, uh, we used to have a, an elderly lady in our church and, uh, one of her comments she would make all the time, this is a red letter day, Jesus. This is a red letter day. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. It's a red letter day, Jesus. And let me tell you, this is a red letter day in the gospel revolution. We love you.